Welcome to episode 27 of the Serious About Security podcast for February 15, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and uh, let me introduce the hosts. Uh, we also have Keith Watson and Mike Hill uh, for this podcast, and we're going to start out for the first article, which I believe is Mike's. Yes, in the uh, first article today, um, we're going to be talking about an iOS 6 bug that lets anyone unlock your phone uh, bypassing your passcode. Um, so, uh, an article came out on um, CN. What was that? CNN. CNET. CNET. That's it. Thank you, Keith. I knew that wasn't right. CNET describing um, how this hack can occur. Uh, user uploaded a video to YouTube, uh, which basically involves kind of uh, almost like entering a cheat code if you played video games. You, you basically go through this uh, key sequence where you turn the phone off, you turn it on, you, um, you, try to, you place an emergency call, you cancel it, you go through this sequence of events and what you end up with is unlocking the, the phone and you have full access to the uh, phone app. Uh, so at that point you could make, um, you can make phone calls you could go through the contacts list and I even read something that if you go to the contact list and you go to the photo of the contact you might be able to get to pictures on the phone. Uh, it appears if you try to do anything beyond that with an iPhone that you just um, you get back to the passcode screen. Um, so this this hack was discovered and Apple has made a statement that they're going to release a patch um, but there's nothing currently available there's really nothing you can do as an iPhone user to um, to prevent this from happening um, uh, you know because it works with the simple pin passcodes but it also works with the uh, passcodes that involve uh, more than four digits that are numbers or letters as well uh, so you know not not a lot that can be done yet at this point uh, to prevent this from happening and uh, so it, it's it's been making some rounds a lot of articles have been coming out about it uh, kind of uh, just warning people that this hack exists I did see something that they had a similar bug back in iOS 4 uh, so you know this has happened to Apple before apparently and um, my, my thoughts on that are because of the way a phone functions and you have to give emergency call features there must be uh, uh, hackers must be able to exploit some kind of vulnerability that something got put into the software uh, with this latest round of iOS 6 that they were able to exploit I don't quite understand how they were able to figure out the key sequence that they have because it's a it's a weird sequence it's not something I think you would necessarily try unless you're just pushing a bunch of different buttons and, and seeing what can happen um, but uh, that, that is something that um, is, is available right now so iPhone users need to be aware uh, at least if you're running iOS 6 which I believe you have to have an iPhone 4s or later and if you're running one of the latest versions your phone is vulnerable to this uh, probably the best advice right now that I could give would be just to keep the device in your possession which is, is really you know good advice anyway and just to recognize that uh, a passcode helps deter uh, people from getting into your phone but it's not necessarily going to prevent everyone from being able to get into it and, and right now a, a vulnerability exists that allows anyone to, to get into your phone app uh, so what do you guys think about this well, I'm wondering why cell phones have kind of this emergency access to dial the phone. Um, so I did a little looking while you were speaking to see if I could find anything that says, hey, you know, the law is that every cell phone has to have a way to bypass the lock screen to get to a, a way you can dial the phone. I haven't found anything to indicate why that is. And the reason I think that's a problem is I think it, you know, if there's no requirement in law or by the FCC to provide emergency access to a phone, then there should be a way to turn that off. And I, while this may not fix the problem here, it may reduce the opportunity for vulnerabilities to be found where somebody could bypass the lock screen. Uh, do you guys know if that's law or FCC requirement. I've not come across that before, yet my Android phone has 
a similar sort of thing where you have on the lock screen an emergency dialer. Yeah, I, I don't know either, um, but I think pretty much every phone that's come out in recent memory has had that feature. Even even the old phones, I believe, that had the, you know, the, the, the handset would lock and you had to push, hold a key down in mm-hmm. order to dial. I, I've had one of those, if you dialed 911 on that phone without unlocking it it would do- it would actually dial that number so it was it's, it was one of those I think it's one of those features that is there just in case you have an absolute emergency and it's hard for you to you know dial the, to unlock your phone and type in things and stuff like that I mean well I, I don't disagree I see the reason for it I'm just wondering where it says in the law or FCC rule that that says all phones have to have that. Uh, I've not found that. So yeah, yeah I, I don't I don't know if there is a requirement for it, but I think it's it's a it's just an understanding that phones are are one of their purposes is an emergency device. But I don't know if they're legally required to do that. I mean, they are obviously the cell phone carriers are required to deal with nine one one service. They are legally yes. required to do that, so so I, I'm not sure if they're legally required to make it easy to use those 911 services. Right, and I know that if you're a wireline uh, uh, telephone provider, that if even if the telephone service has been terminated at an address, I believe there's a, a requirement from the FCC, or maybe it's state law, because I know this is true in California when I live there. Uh, even if the telephone has been disconnected, you still have to be able to be able to dial 911 on that phone and get through to emergency service. You can't dial anywhere else, but you can dial. Maybe you can call the company and say, I'd like to put service on this phone. But they uh, had to support uh, dialing 911 even for disconnected phones. Yeah, and I so, believe that's true with the cell phones as well, that even when you terminate service with the cell phone, I believe... Um, that you can still dial 911 and that call has to be completed. I think that's why they collect a lot of those cell phones and they hand them out. Um, I believe it has to fulfill the 911 call. Um, but I, I'm not aware of any law necessarily that states it, but I would imagine that uh, uh, the Android and Apple devices would get a lot of flack if they took that emergency call feature away. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and I'm still looking here for an article that may explain this, but um, it seems to me that that the emergency mode may have been one way to bypass this uh, the lock screen and get access to some parts of the the phone and contacts. And I wonder if by removing that emergency dialer option, if that would would have prevented that. That's it's not clear. Obviously, we don't know. But if you can't, that sequence didn't work. Yeah, it wasn't but clear. Are, it, would there be another sequence that might, or just the fact that you you're accessing the phone dialing app, and you have to provide that through um, a bypass in the lock screen, and that interaction is where the vulnerability lies. So maybe you could prevent this one. Would you prevent others? It's not clear. Yeah, and I, you know, again, there wasn't any details. It, to me, you know, um, using the video game analogy, a lot of times those cheat codes, those were back doors in the in the so, in the gaming software. So, you know, was this specifically? Does you know, was there a back door designed during the testing phase, and then it was just left in when it went and you know when the software was released? You know, like I said, it's not an obvious. Uh, set of sequences that you have to follow, but it's not that difficult to do either. Almost like it was by design. If you do this sequence in this way, you can bypass certain features. And I could see maybe while developing things and testing things, they might have that backdoor there, but would you know would close it off. I mean, nothing in the article stated it was a backdoor by Apple, but I just wonder why a particular sequence, how someone was able to determine. How, how to get into that, unless they were just picking up the phone and just trying random things and, and got lucky and came across something. 
Well, there are people with lots of time on their hand, and maybe that's what they do. I don't know. Or it could be somebody said, hey, by the way, you know, an insider perhaps said, I know this way to bypass the lock screen. Check it out. You know, it's one of those uh, insider information sorts of things. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think we call those people security researchers, don't we? Sometimes. They <laughs> have a lot of time on their hands and just do things just to... to Try and break stuff? Uh, sometimes, yes. <laughs> it yeah. Depends on if that's their primary job. Then they do tend to spend a lot of time doing that, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, I find it interesting that they had a similar vulnerability in iOS 4, and it comes back again in iOS 6. Um, like I said, I wonder if there's some reason, if there's some code being left around because it has a really useful testing purpose, but it sneak, keeps getting snuck back in, or uh, maybe someone's working with old software and checks it in, and they've, you know, so it has a flaw in it, or, or maybe it's just not related and it's just a coincidence. But but I find coincidences like that to be uh, hard to come by. So I, I wonder what the what the issue might have been here that that allowed this to happen. But uh, yeah, I, I think. Because of the emergency call mode, and again, I think it's something they're going to have to support, uh, it kind of gives a, a window of opportunity there. If, if people can work around that, uh, like they did in this case, you know, they can get into the phone. It, it, but with that being said, you know, um, all they can do is use your phone app. Now, maybe if you have a very limited data plan and they're calling Russia and <laughs> talking for 18 hours, they're going to cost you a lot of money. Uh, but Everything I read said you could not. It could not break out of the phone app, so it couldn't get into other apps on your device. Uh, you know, like your Dropbox app, where you could get to confidential documents, for example, or something right. along those lines. Okay. All right. Well, uh, the other article we were going to talk about today um, is not only an article so much it is as it is the. Uh, presidential executive order that President Obama signed. Uh, I believe prior to his State of the Union address and he mentioned it in the State of the Union address and and then this was published shortly after that by the uh, press secretary and basically the title is Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity and in is in some respects kind of a follow-on to some other attempts at cybersecurity legislation in the previous Congress and this is an attempt to kind of spur further movement in that area and to do it through the process of an executive order. Now, with the executive orders, there's, you know, they're not law. Um, they are totally up to the president to decide what to do. And, and it only typically applies to the executive branch of government. However, the executive branch of government is the biggest branch of government, so it does affect quite a few things, but mostly federal agencies. So this one in particular talks a lot about uh, collaboration, coordination, developing policies. It, it kind of leaves out um, any real teeth in terms of enforcement outside of federal government. So that's a problem. I think the, the idea here was that, um, and it might be all politics, the president wanted to uh, make some advancement in addressing cybersecurity issues that have not so far occurred through the legislative branch. So you'll see a lot if you read through it and it's it's rather lengthy but it talks a lot about you know defining what our critical infrastructure is developing policies uh, sharing information which we can talk about later uh, also there's discussion of protecting privacy and civil liberties which was a big concern with the previous legislation that had been proposed and I don't know that this addresses that adequately yet. The other one was very intrusive. This one is probably just as intrusive, but they just put, say, hey, we looked at it. It's okay. Uh, that'll have to be reviewed a little bit more probably. There's discussion about creating baseline frameworks. Um, there's a lot of voluntary critical infrastructure that has to be done. Um, just looking through the, the list here so I can point out a few things. Um, there's discussion about involving various national uh, federal agencies in developing this framework we talked about. 
um, and then yeah so it's it's kind of like a, hey look we're doing something but what gets done it mostly applies to federal government where the problem is that even though the federal government you know has uh, some responsibility for critical infrastructure at least by the way it's defined most of that infrastructure is owned by private organizations um, so some of the cybersecurity legislation that was being proposed would would, would have required the uh, private owners of critical infrastructure to increase their cybersecurity defense uh, but didn't really fund it and just labeled you know leveled a bunch of requirements on on those organizations um, saying you know you have to be now in addition to all the other compliance issues you have you now have cybersecurity compliance to worry about too this doesn't do that um, like again it mostly applies to federal agencies so probably the biggest one that I you know that they talk about but we don't see a lot of good movement on is this idea of information sharing um, ideally we would want to see the federal government share more with private sector but from my understanding is that doesn't happen a whole lot it's a kind of a one-way sharing uh, those entities report information to the federal government and then the federal government never shares anything that they hear you know from multiple organizations so there's that and then the other problem with which I found kind of funny is um, our our own government has been implicated in creating uh, cyber war weapons and launching them in many cases uh, specifically Iran with Stuxnet um, and yet you know this is the like say hey we need to protect our own infrastructure from ourselves watch out people so I found that interesting well <clears throat> well I think uh, I mean even though I think pretty much this whole thing is voluntary I think creating frameworks, policies, standards, and things like that that are an example for the private uh, companies to use is assuming they're not they're not bad policies, standards, or frameworks. I think is uh, the first step in getting the private sector organizations to actually do something. I mean, it's it's difficult to create a security program. Uh, especially if you don't really have one and giving them the tools to to kind of start not start not start from ground zero and have something in place I think is is valuable assuming it is you know they're they're, they're good um, but I think in until we have either a law that requires them to do it or some major incident um, I don't think much is going to happen. Yeah, you may be right. And I agree that frameworks are good, but I think the framework should be developed with the private sector, not developed by federal government and handed over to the private sector. And, I, and I'm not sure that that's what this is going to do yet. There's an open public review and comment process, of course, but usually by that point it's a little late to make major changes to any sort of framework so you know if they said hey we're gonna we're gonna involve private industry in development or we're gonna say uh, you know you guys develop it and we'll support that as the standard you know that's one way to do it but it doesn't seem to be that approach yeah I wonder how um how much will actually happen to I, I think it's great to have a start you know but it's being voluntary um, I just you know as, as Preston mentioned you know until a major incident happens uh, not that we want one to happen but I just don't think people take these things all that seriously and they don't understand the impact of you know what what the fallout would be from a, a major cybersecurity attack and you know, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see things moving forward in the direction, but in a sense, it would have been nice to have seen maybe, I guess, more stronger language. It would say we are going to, at a minimum, do these things instead of it being more voluntary in nature. Um, and I know it's hard just to get started with something, but uh, it'd been nice to see some actions that would say 
these things are going to take place, you know, these these very low level things and then build on those. Right. And I and I think that thanks to the FISMA law, which required federal government agencies to implement their own information security management practices and the fact that that required NIST to develop those standards and publish that, they've got a lot to start with. Now, the, you know, obviously the federal government agency approach to information security is going to be different than private sector, but at least there's something out there right now that NIST has already done, which will be a good starting point. Maybe it's overly cumbersome for a private sector and they could just trim some of what's in there out. That might be one approach too. So it kind of remains to be seen what's going to happen. I know that according to this, the, the presidential, or I'm sorry, the executive order says that NIST basically, I think it says NIST, uh, yeah, NIST is, is basically the one on the hook for developing those standards, and that makes sense. They've done it before. All right, and with that, we'll wrap it up. Uh, I want to thank the hosts of the podcast, uh, Keith Watson and Mike Hill. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.